Chapter 7. We won't by any means get finished with Chapter 7, but 7, 8, and 9 is the nervous system. Why don't you just knock on the floor? <laughs> chapter 7 is kind of an introductory to all the little components of the nervous system. And, and then Chapter 8 deals with the central nervous system, and Chapter 9 deals with the peripheral nervous system. And if we separate those two just in general in the beginning of this chapter, We've always known as central nervous system being the brain and spinal cord. What what have you learned about the peripheral nervous system? What would be your quick saying about the peripheral nervous system? I said quick saying about the peripheral. <laughs> <laughs> so that would be you know, a quick response there from one of twelve of you. It, it doesn't matter who. So what you're telling me is you've absolutely learned nothing in the. 18 to 20 something years of your life and so I'm starting at ground zero. The peripheral nervous system typically is taught as everything outside the central mm -hmm. nervous system. Have you ever heard that? No. Okay, now we've got a recall. Everything outside the, the central nervous system is, uh, is a lot. Let's put it that way. They, in fact, so much that they put an entire chapter to it and I'm not sure we get it all covered even at that. It really gets down to a lot of the, the entities that we tend to overlook and uh, not completely understand for sure. So hopefully we'll grasp an understanding in chapter nine of the peripheral nervous system and the central nervous system in chapter eight. And this one will kind of get a grasp of all the components that goes with those two. Now, to just give you a quick idea, of how extensive the peripheral nervous system is. I've designed, uh, in fact, this flow chart may be in your notes. It probably should be in your notes. I put together a flow chart to give you an idea as soon as this comes up. I don't think it is. You don't think it's in your notes? Right after chapter 12, when it goes to circulation and chapter 16. Whoops. Maybe this should be in the quotes of the day that you draw out of that. <laughs> the peripheral nervous system, uh, getting a visual of a flow chart, this will kind of give That's you an idea. Very, it's like the very last page. Uh, you do have it. Very good. I wasn't totally brain dead when I put those notes together, just almost. You can see a very small portion of peripheral nervous system dealing with the somatic, which is voluntary, skeletal muscle, and then the rest of it deals with autonomic. And you think of autonomic as things that happen automatically, which is true, although the book tells you don't think of automatic when you think of autonomic, but it's hard not to think of automatic when you think of autonomic, especially when the book tells you not to think of automatic when you think of autonomic. So we tend to think automatic when we say autonomic. You lost me at automatic. <laughs> well, it should be automatically autonomic or autonomically automatic, one or the other. But the autonomic system works in spite, if you want to say, that, say it that way. You have the pathetic systems, sympathetic and parasympathetic, and, and they're the pathetic duo that's typically uh, antagonistic to each other except for just a handful of cases which we'll talk about and that's a very small handful of cases and then your sympathetic breaks off in the adrenergic which is alpha and beta and we'll get a lot of alpha and beta in that chapter 9 in fact you'll have at least 16 matching questions of alpha and beta responses I'll give you a scenario and you tell me if it's an alpha response or a beta response on the test but I'll prepare you for that and if you don't study it and don't do well on it, that's your own fault because I'll simplify it to the point where you should get at least 80 or 90 percent of them as no-brainers. So the parasympathetic, this is your everyday mundane couch potato mode. That's, this is, I like the way the old Zoe book put it, everyday mundane vegetative activities. It doesn't get any lower than vegetative, okay? And that's your parasympathetic mode. And that's what I see in y'all every Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 9 o'clock in the morning. I see a lot of vegetation going on. Slow brain activity. We're not awake yet. So a little caffeine goes a long ways, don't curl. Getting things 
She's hitting heavy stuff up here. She's I don't know what what's mixed in with this, but <laughs> she's usually pretty spiked up up here. <laughs> so yeah, the cholinergic and adrenergic tend to be kind of uh, antagonistic. And anytime you hear the term adrenergic, you should think of these three things. You should think of norepinephrine, postganglionic, and sympathetic. Anytime you see the term cholinergic, you should, you should remember ACH, preganglionic, and parasympathetic. And kind of a, a word scenario, I'll throw a word at you and those things should pop in your head just like that, right? We'll get to it eventually. But hopefully this uh, enlightens you on, there's a lot to say about the peripheral nervous system. And if it didn't work on its own, we'd sure enough be in trouble, wouldn't we? I mean, look at all the things that happened without us thinking about it. We wouldn't be able to function in life trying to just make ourselves function, just the entities that make life livable, right? We're just thinking about that, we almost shut down, didn't we? So let's go back to chapter seven. I'll bring this back up. You have it in your notes. <clears throat> we'll talk about this more as we get in chapter eight, <coughs> chapter nine. Chapter eight is really a neat chapter because it gets into the entities and the things that we'll really talk about in the lab. So, and we'll start the lab stuff next week. So, at the beginning of chapter seven, they first talk about. Uh, the central nervous system and peripheral nervous system. Then they talk about different types of neurons, and there's three basic neurons. The three basic neurons are sensory neurons, motor neurons, and association neurons. Is there another name for any of those? Afferent? Efferent? An interneuron. Somebody didn't like the original name, so we renamed them. But you'll run across both of these names a lot. Afferent or sensory neurons uh, carry, they pick up impulses. They carry impulses to the central nervous system. So we're going to the central nervous system. Efferent is going away from the central nervous system. And interneurons, also known as association neurons, are the most abundant, and they're found in the central nervous system. Most abundant and found in the central nervous system. Now, if we take one of these neurons and try to conduct an impulse, this is the rest of the drawing I kind of have up here. I don't know if that'll focus on this or not, Tracy. We may be too far away. If we start, here we have dendrites, we have cell body, axon hillock is the beginning of the axon. <clears throat> then the axon runs the link down through here until we come to a synaptic cleft, which is a, a space between this neuron and another neuron, or it could be a neuromuscular space, which would be between the neuron and a muscle. And for years and years and years, they thought we were like total electric. <laughs> we're not total electric. Uh, we're electrical chemical, electrical chemical. We'll conduct down the length of this axon. The book says don't use the word conduct. And then it turns around and says conduction. So uh, I use it from time to time. But they'll, they'll tell you to use the term regenerate. We'll regenerate down the length of this axon. And then we'll use chemicals to get from this axon to the next one, or this presynaptic neuron to the postsynaptic neuron. So we're electrical, 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 chemical. Electrical, 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 chemical. So we utilize a lot of chemicals and forms of neurotransmitters, which at one time we thought we had about 20 different kinds of neurotransmitters, and now we're well up at over 40 different kinds of neurotransmitters. And they're not new substances that we've discovered in the body. They're some of the same substances used as neurotransmitters in different parts of the body. Uh, cholecystokinin. This is a digestive enzyme that promotes bile production from the liver that helps emulsify fats in small intestine. Cholecystokinin is a neurotransmitter in the brain that helps us 
lay down information of whether we like or dislike food. So it's a neurotransmitter, plus it plays a role in digestion. Okay, so if we start this process, we're going to start with a threshold stimulus. What is threshold? Maximum amount. Minimum amount. Minimum amount. Yeah, that's, that's the beginning. Would you agree threshold can be different for everybody? Absolutely. I mean, some people have high tolerance of pain. Some people have no tolerance to pain. They just look at somebody in pain and they, they feel the pain already. But the threshold is different for everybody. So whatever your threshold is, that's the level at which we'll start this. The book says don't use conduction, but we're going to conduct it. We're going to regenerate it as well. So the dendrites pick it up, and it starts at the axon hillock. And it jumps from node of reindeer to node of reindeer. Now jumping from node of reindeer to node of reindeer is called saltatory conduction. If they truly stayed with what they said to say, they said saltatory regeneration, but they said saltatory conduction. So saltatory conduction means jumping of a node of rain gear to node of rain gear. The reason it jumps is because of these myelin sheaths. These myelin sheaths speed conduction. So if you have one definition of myelin, you say it speeds conduction. It speeds conduction by allowing the impulse to only hit high points of the axon. If it was trying to go all the way through the axon, resistance would be so high it would actually slow things down. Would it finally get there? Maybe. Would it get there fast enough? Probably not. Because we have different kinds of neurons. I've, I've picked one here that's probably the fastest. It's a myelinated large neuron. We have unmyelinated large neurons that conduct pretty fast. We have small myelinated neurons, and we have small unmyelinated. Now, the slowest one is a very small unmyelinated neuron. Where in the body would we need slow conduction? I'm not saying where you have slow conduction. I'm saying where you need slow conduction. At 9 o'clock in the morning, it's usually in your brain. But digestive. digestive tract, absolutely. We, we can't just pump the food right on through. We forget we even ate it. It went to go through so fast. So it goes through slow enough to digest, and it's very slow, smooth, wave-like contractions, <laughs> and we need this. And it runs about a meter per second. That's maxed out. I mean, that's on the floorboard, fast as it'll go. Now, our fastest one, like here, right here, runs about uh, 225 miles per hour. That's fast enough, isn't it? So, where would we need this? How about a reflex? Skeletal muscle response. It's quick, but it doesn't last. We need it quick, though. So that's where you find something like this. We need to respond to something really fast. All right. So now that we have the different kinds of neurons kind of set up, we know that myelin plays the huge role of speeding conduction to reduce resistance. Our, uh, our conductive ability is rather poor when you compare it to copper wire. So we try to increase conduction by reducing resistance. And just hitting the high points is going to reduce resistance because at each high point, at each node of reindeer is where we regenerate it. If we take a node of reindeer and look at it, we see that sodium is our extracellular fluid ion, right? It's on the, on the test coming up. What's our intracellular fluid ion? Oh, I didn't know if he was going to get that or not. Potassium is our most abundant intracellular fluid ion. Both are positive charges. When this threshold stimulus is triggered, and we hit the first note of reindeer, we're sitting here at negative 70 millivolts. Isn't that standard? Negative 70? And so the influx of sodium causes an action potential. The influx of sodium is what releases the electrical activity here 
that regenerates that impulse at the same level in which it started, and it continues at the same level at which it started, and it ends at the same level at which it started. And so they refer to that as, uh, let's see, conduction, conduct, conducts without decrement. Conduction or conducts without decrement. In other words, it conducts without loss of amplitude. Without whatever it starts with is the level it ends with. Again, they say, do not use the word conduct, and then you turn around and they explain conduction without decrement. Without loss of amplitude. So whatever if threshold is here, that's the level it finds it at the far end. If it fizzles out before it gets there, it's like the brain said, What was that message you sent to me? We didn't get it, right? So we have to get it at the same stimulus level in which it originally fired the first neuron. So we conduct without decrement by way of salt story conduction. And again, the influx of sodium is what triggers an action potential. Keep that in mind. Influx of sodium is what triggers an action potential. And when sodium rushes in, it forces potassium out. Now potassium already has, potassium already has an outflow. It has two channels. One that's open all the time, and one that's forced open when sodium rushes in. Would you agree that like charges repel each other? And that's what's happening here. Sodium comes in, forces potassium out, we, our negative 70 can go to zero all the way to a positive 40. Now positive 40 is going to max that out. Normally about a positive 20 is where it's going to end up. And quickly we have uh, active transport pumps. Active transport pumps that pump the potassium back in and sodium out. And I believe it's three sodium to two potassium. Three sodium out to two potassium puts us back to a resting state of negative 70 millivolts, and then that particular Renault brain gear could actually conduct another impulse once it reaches at least zero. We're going to get to different levels at which it can conduct another impulse. You have an absolute refractory period and a relative refractory period that we'll talk about when we start fiddling through this chapter, probably Monday. And the absolute refractory period says if we're in the middle of conducting the first impulse, we absolutely will not conduct another. The relative refractory period says, relatively speaking, if the second impulse is greater than the first impulse, and we're almost finished with the first one, in other words, these nodes of Rangier are close back to zero, we're already getting them back to a resting potential, then if the second impulse is greater than the first, we'll commence to conduct in the second impulse. Does that make sense, relatively speaking? Of course. Or absolutely not. I'm glad you gathered all that. We're just getting started. So this is the end of chapter six as well when we was talking about uh, action potentials, resting potentials, and regeneration where we're putting it back to the resting potential. Repolarization, I believe, is what the book called it. Would we have to be close to zero or we will not relatively conduct the larger impulse? We have to be headed back to zero, finished with the first one. If we're in the middle conducting it, we forget the second one. It's not even going to recognize it. All right. So once we get down to this far end down here, we, we've got to get it across this, this cleft. And you've heard of the synapse before, right? A synapse just literally means bridge. We've got to bridge the gap. And to bridge the gap, the original threshold stimulus caused the release of calcium. Calcium rushed ahead of the conducted signal and caused the synaptic end bulbs to release a neurotransmitter. The neurotransmitter is there and in place by the time the impulse gets there. And so we electrical, 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 chemical, electrical, electrical. We don't miss a lick because it's already there and in place. 
Now we're going to use the acetylcholine as the neurotransmitter of choice here because it's a very excitatory neurotransmitter, especially in skeletal muscle. Acetylcholine stuck in the heart does nothing. Norepinephrine stuck in skeletal muscle does nothing. Norepinephrine in the heart excites it. See, so it's specialized in where it's at. So acetylcholine has bridged the gap, and as soon as the impulse hits the chemical and jumps to the next neuron, then we remove the bridge. We simply get rid of the bridge. We don't need it anymore. And to remove acetylcholine, you have to use acetylcholine esterase, ACH ACE, acetylcholine esterase. It's an enzyme that destroys acetylcholine. Now there's different ways we handle neurotransmitters. A lot of neurotransmitters we use when, we get, when we're done with them, we put them back in storage because we don't make a lot of them. Some of them we use up. Uh, unfortunately, uh, when you get in some of the neurotransmitters in the brain, sometimes we use them faster than we can make them. Things like serotonin. Um, what's another one? Oh, we'll come across it later in the chapter, but it, it mimics uh, cocaine, but I can't think of it right now. Or cocaine maybe mimics it. Maybe that's a normal way to say there. <laughs> anyway, uh, some of those we don't destroy. We reuptake and then use them again later. And there's drugs on the market out there, antidepressants, that prevents destruction of things like serotonin. And so if we're not making serotonin, which you make it when you sleep. So if your sleep wake cycles off, shift work is a very common thing here. Sleep wake cycles off, serotonin levels are down, you're really tired, you're lethargic, you don't have a lot of energy, serotonin levels are down, so you take this antidepressant, and what it does is keep serotonin out in the synaptic cleft longer, and you reuse the same serotonin until you get your cycles right and you start building it back again. And as you start building it, we can gradually take you off that. And like Zoloft is supposed to be non-addictive because of that. Now Pro Prozac, yeah, it can be kind of addictive. So, but all of those, uh, M M A M O I M O A the inhibitors, I think they're what they're called, they prevent the destruction and the reuptake, they leave it out there in the synapse. So it keeps you alert more often. And kind of a feel-good drug, yeah. Serotonin's some good stuff. I mean, it, it's like uh, your son comes to you and says, uh, wrecked the car today. Oh, that's no big deal, are you okay? Before you just punched him and give him a whooping, grounded him 14 times, and you're gonna be in the house the rest of your life, and then you think, uh, are you okay? Now it's, are you okay? We can replace the car. It's no big deal. Insurance is just skyrocket, but we'll get another job. That's what serotonin does for you. <laughs> it's good stuff. Keeps you from killing your kids. <laughs> Keeps you out of jail. Drugs keep you out of jail. Did I say that on film? Can, can we edit that? <laughs> Depends on what drugs you're talking about. So the synaptic end bulbs is where it's been held. We remove it, so at that point we could start conducting another one if another one was greater than the first one, and then we would obviously bridge the gap again. Uh, this, this is also the same gap that uh, local anesthetics utilize. What a, what a local, anybody ever had an ingrown toenail cut out? That's usually a fairly common thing. That you, I don't know why. You, I see more of it today. I guess our grandparents just lived with ingrown toenails and they didn't get them cut out. They just lived with it. But uh, the doctor comes in there and, and he gives you these series of shots around the knuckle of the big toe, right? Mm -hmm. oh, feel really good, don't oh, yeah. <laughs> Well, what he's giving you is an anesthetic. The anesthetic comes in here and binds to these receptors. So when the, when the toe's feeling pretty good and he starts his jerking around on the toenail and sticking a scraper underneath there and breaking it loose and then he grabs a pair of pliers and, goes, and just pulls flesh and everything out. 
That sounds disgusting, doesn't it? And you're looking at this thinking, that's got to hurt. And you feel a little pressure and a little bit of maneuvering of flesh, but you're really not in any pain, are you? I mean, if he does it right. So what happened is we fired off some calcium. You think threshold stimulus was hit? It was off the charts up here. <laughs> calcium rushed ahead to send out the neurotransmitter, and it had no place to attach to. That's like, I'm going to lay a board from this side of the river to that side of the river, and there's nothing laid on it, it just falls off in the river. That's what happened to pain. It was moving fast. <laughs> Fell off the river. So it didn't make it to your brain, and your brain's thinking, I should be, uh, I'm seeing pain, I should be feeling pain. But it's not. And so the doctor gave you a prescription of these nice little painkillers that'll make you feel good later. So when this anesthetic starts wearing off, you think your toe still hurts? Oh yeah, we're still firing. I mean, we're firing all the way. And when that starts wearing off, we start bridging the gap. Your toe starts throbbing a little. And then you feel a little more pain in it. Then somebody accidentally steps on it. <laughs> that finished you off, didn't it? Oh, I wish I'd have taken the painkiller. So we go from a local anesthetic to a mind painkiller. That's what the pill does, block it in your mind. It's probably majorly inhibiting prostaglandins like we talked about and making you feel good and seeing little bunnies at the same time. Some of those do. Some of those I can't take at all. I'm floating, seeing bunnies, clowns, and everything else. It's like, uh, that, that makes you feel where I'd rather have the pain than seeing all these little bunnies running around. That's, that's bad. What kind of painkillers are Well, I don't do painkillers. I don't, you know, it's like an anesthetic. You know, if they put me under for surgery, they can use half the amount of what my body size says, and I would be fine. If they give me full amount, I'm the first one in surgery, and I'm the last one to leave that day. They can't get me away. And of course, I tell them that, and I'm an idiot. I'm just a physiology teacher. I don't even know my own body. And they go, yeah, right, okay, we'll take care of you. Don't worry about it. Just, just count backwards to 10. And then after that, they're, we'd like to go home today. Would you like to get up and go home today? So they throw me in a wheelchair, and I vomit all the way out because they give me too much of the stuff. And that's just, everybody's different in, in how, they, how they handle that. You know, if you take a drug addict into surgery, you may have to double the amount of anesthetic to get their response. But a person, some, some bodies are way more sensitive, so they could actually get by with less, but they've got a standard amount that they use according to body weight, and it, it keeps them from getting sued and killing people. So that's what they're going to use. Now, they, they don't want anybody in any pain, so if they used half the amount on me and I woke up in knee surgery saying, hey, man, will you quit stabbing my knee down there? They don't want that either, so they just they'd rather me be out for a while and not be away. Doesn't from it also surgery. make you forget the like I read I read in one of my pharmacology books that they make you forget. Well, if you're not conscious when it's happening, you probably never knew it happened. I know. <laughs> so that's exactly what happens. Uh, the Indians used to use a uh, substance called Carrer on the end of their darts and arrows, and Carrer. Would, would block this in their animals, and by blocking this process in animals, somehow it actually stopped diaphragm functioning and killed their animals by asphyxiation. And uh, so it, it was a good way for them. I mean, they didn't actually have to hit a lethal shot to get their animal, and they were good enough tracking, they could track it down. So a few years ago, some uh, archery experts, so so to speak, some, some archery hunters over in Arkansas got their hands on some prayer. <laughs> so they're going to kill their deer. They're going to get their big buck, you know. Well, the game warden found out about it. Of course, lit them all up. Took, took away their trucks, license, archery, gun, just wiped them out. And found out that their anesthesiology friend is the one that gave it to them. He lost his license and he's out of business. So I wouldn't mess with career. It's, it's illegal to use on your darts and arrows. You use them on your kids, I guess. Dart them. But uh, that, that was not a good thing for the archery people. And that was not that long ago, but I'd like to know who the anesthesiologist was. I'd just pay attention and see who's missing over there. Wasn't bright. 
but that's how it works in here as well. And uh, that's kind of an overall look of the conduction of an impulse or, as the book would say, a regeneration of an impulse. Have any direct questions? Okay. Now, as we travel through the book, we're going to see them talking about this same stuff. I'm just going to show you in the book where you need to be reading and studying. On page 163, there's your sensory neurons, association neurons, motor neurons. They even talk about somatic motor neurons, which we saw with the peripheral nervous system, and autonomic motor neurons we also saw in the peripheral nervous system. And then on 164, they give us a definition of a nerve. A nerve is a bundle of axons located outside the central nervous system. And then here's your support cells. We've learned the name of all our support cells together called glial cells or neuroglia. Here they're going to list six different kinds of neuroglia. Now keep in mind these are neuron support cells. These are the only ones of the nervous system capable of mitosis. So if anywhere in the nervous system cancer shows up, one of these cells are responsible because cancer is mitosis out of control. And these are the only things in the nervous system capable of mitosis. All right? So the first one, these are found in the peripheral nervous system. The first one are swan cells. Well, swan cells make myelin. And myelin is just a lipid is all it is. So swan cells make myelin, and we know myelin speeds conduction. That's a pretty good support cell if we want to speed things up. Satellite cells are ganglionic gliocytes. Somebody like tongue twisters or they was drinking or something when they come up with ganglionic gliocytes. Which support neuron cell bodies within the ganglia of the peripheral nervous system. We already know it's a support cell. And when they don't tell us anything else, I'll tell you right now what we really know about this. Nothing. We know it's there. And then all their definition says they support neuron cell bodies in the ganglia. Yeah, we already knew this support cells. So we really don't know what these do at this point. Now, in a few years, we may have something. I don't know. And then we get into four types of support cells in the central nervous system. The first one's oligodendrocyte. It's exactly the same thing as swan cells. They just change the name because it's in the central nervous system. It produces myelin. And then we have microglia. Microglia of the central nervous system is about the same as lysosomes of a cell. They're the police. They clean up. They clean up the mess, degenerated material, phagocytized form material. They're, just, they're the police. And number three, astrocytes, which help to regulate the external environment of neurons in the central nervous system. That's pretty vague. But I'll tell you this, astrocytes are the most abundant, and they're busy. We're going to have several listings of what astrocytes do in a couple of pages. These are the most abundant, and they are busy. Probably the number one thing that they actually do is create a blood-brain barrier, which makes it extremely difficult to get anything across this barrier into the brain to treat illnesses, to treat infections. We can't, even, we, we can't even take dopamine, which is one I was trying to think of a while ago. We can't take true dopamine and cross this barrier and get into the brain. Now we found or developed a synthetic form of dopamine called levodopa, which we treat Parkinson's symptoms with, and we can sneak it through. There's only a handful of antibiotics we can use for meningitis because of what astrocytes do, which is kind of a good thing and a bad thing when we're trying to treat something. It's good that it protects it. We probably don't have to treat near as much as we would have, but when there's something does sneak through there, then it's difficult to treat. The last one, ependymal cells, which line the ventricles of the brain and central canal and spinal cord. What does it do? We have no idea because <laughs> they didn't tell us anything. Well, so, I mean, all of these are still out there, still a lot of research to be done. Physiology is a young science. 
maybe in 10 years from now, they may come back and revamp some of their thoughts and theories on these other things. As technology increases, and some of these have been researched so much that they're probably researching something else and they'll accidentally figure out, oh man, that, what's that doing there? We didn't expect that, and that's how they discover a lot of these things. But two of these, satellite cells and epidermal cells, at this point, we really don't know what they do. Neurolema and myelin, we know speeds conduction. Really nothing else to say about that. Myelin sheath is, uh, of course, in between the myelin sheath are nodes of reindeer. Here's a kind of a definition of a node of reindeer. A node of reindeer is an interruption in the myelin sheath. And that interruption promotes speed. It promotes impulse traveling at the fastest level. Now on page 166, they talk about regeneration of cut axon. What do you think the chances of a cut axon regenerating in the human body is today? A cut nerve, if you will. Anybody ever damaged a nerve? It's like a week, isn't it? In, in general, a damaged nerve from a young child or, or, or a young adult may have a chance to regenerate itself. The younger, the greater the chance. The older, the lesser the chance. The larger, the lesser the chance. Unless it's so large, we can actually surgically sew it back together and we can add some back to it. Those mediocre sized ones, the older we get, less chance of any neuron regeneration. In, well, if there was, Superman dumped lots of money in on this. When he fell off a horse and messed himself up and was in a wheelchair the rest of his life, he dumped tons of money in into this kind of research because, of course, he was paralyzed from waist down. And if it was going to happen, he'd have found it. This is what they've come up with, that research. There's a perfect scenario. We cannot seem to create this perfect scenario. But this is what has to happen. Number one. Nerves can grow if they're, if they're provided with a proper environment. Here's the proper environment. They must have a myelin sheath. If it's a large, unmyelinated nerve, forget it. It's not going to happen. Must have a myelin sheath. And what that does, a myelin sheath will provide a pathway, a direction for that nerve to grow. Now we know we're supposed to go through that myelin sheath. So we've got to have a myelin sheath. Number two, neurotropins to promote growth. A neurotropin is a neuron growth promoter. And they've discovered about, I don't know, seven or eight of these at least. And we're going to talk about some of those in a minute. We'll list them, just mention them. Number three, you need to inhibit the myelin association inhibitory proteins. In other words, they found proteins in there that inhibit the regeneration of an axon, and we've got to stop. The inhibitory proteins. If we can get rid of the inhibitory proteins, if we have a myelin sheath and we throw some growth promoter on, we fertilize it, <laughs> throw some growth promoter on there, we have a chance. But it's slim. Can you repeat that? We have to inhibit the inhibitory proteins. Inhibit the inhibitory proteins. And the neurotropins are listed on 167 and 168. Nerve growth factor, brain-derived neurotropic factor, glial-derived neurotropic factor, neurotropin-3, this is the one I like, neurotropin-4 fits. They had not found all of it yet, but they will. I have faith in them. Nerve growth factor and neurotropin-3 are known to be particularly important in the embryonic development of sensory neurons and sympathetic ganglia. That's why they say the younger you are, the better chance, because they still feel like some of these are in the system, the younger you are. After that, we're not sure if there's a sufficient amount of them to help you regenerate. Look back on 166 to clinical application. Multiple sclerosis, we've heard of it, haven't we? 
common neurological disease, usually diagnosed in people, most often women, between the ages of 20 and 40. You think this can be genetically inherited? Mm -hmm. You know what's sad? They didn't know they had it until after they had children. Would that have made a difference in their choice of having children or not? Mm -hmm. Very well could have. I mean, it would with some people and it wouldn't with some people. Now we're pretty good at treating some of these symptoms now, slowing down the progression. And multiple sclerosis, which they consider an autoimmune disease, something, this disease is gradually deteriorating the myelin sheaths. And so what once was a, a tripped over a crack in a sidewalk three times last year, this year I tripped over the same crack six times. Next year, 15 times. Next year, 30 times. You see the gradual progression, progression, but so gradual, it's nothing. Well, I'm clumsy today. Just having more clumsy days than I used to. So it's an autoimmune, very slow, over time, debilitating. There's some muscle atrophy because if muscles are not actively acted upon by, uh, by stimulus, then they atrophy. If you take away nerve innervation from your skeletal muscle, they'll atrophy every time. So there's some atrophy. And they list some of this as hardening or sclerotic scarring of some of the myelin, which it just don't work like it was once did. Followed by axonal degeneration. So the axon's actually breaking down. Because the degeneration is widespread and affects different areas of the nervous system in different people, MS has wider variety of symptoms than any other neurological disease. And that makes it extremely hard to pinpoint and diagnose. Because it'll affect this person in this way, and this person this way, a different parts of the nervous system in this person. It's not just the basic same symptoms every time. The causes of MS are not fully understood, but are believed to be involved in a number of genes that affect a person's susceptibility to environmental agents, such as viruses, that may trigger an immune attack on self-antigens in the central nervous system. So we consider it autoimmune. Somehow your body's attacking its own conductive system, myelin. I do have a test question over that reason I kind of emphasize that a little bit. One of those scenarios. Look on 168. In fact, I'm, I'm going to quit right here with functions of astrocytes. And they have seven functions of astrocytes. So we're going to emphasize that quite a bit. Go on with the blood-brain barrier. We'll talk about Parkinson's. Electrical, electrical activity is re what we've been discussing up here. And we'll probably zip on through this chapter somewhere around next month. Be ready for chapter 8.